Hello, welcome everybody. I am um, Anna Katharina Gebers and I'm a curator of contemporary art at the National Gallery im Hamburger Bahnhof Museum für Gegenwart in Berlin. And today I'm hosting our joint online program event as part of um, the Collecting Entanglements and Embodied Histories project. And um, Collecting Entanglements and Embodied Histories is a dialogue between the collections of Galerie Nacional Indonesia, the uh, Mayim Contemporary Art Museum in Chiang Mai, um, the National Galerie Staatliche Museum to Berlin, and the Singapore Art Museum. It was initiated by the Goethe Institute. The project um, manifests as four exhibitions with distinctive curatorial narratives in the four collaborating institutions, regular online public programs, live streamed on Facebook and YouTube, like this one, a video essay series by art practitioners, um, on selectors, artists, and more are included in this project. And the curatorial team consists of Grace Zambo, um, Gritia Gavivong, June Yap, and me. And um, the artists, the group of artists that um, are joining our conversation today are all participants of the exhibition Nation Eurasian Mercosis, which is one of the four um, um, exhibitions deriving from collecting entanglements and embodied histories, and which is taking place at Hamburger Bahnhof Museum for Gegenwart in Berlin. And the works in this exhibition all tell their own stories about the often brutal processes of nation building, um, the role assigned to art in that process um, and which hegemonic as well as alternative forms of community and accompanying narratives are conceivable and could be reflected in artworks. And um, as we are a museum which is hosting a lot of um, environment of, and uh, installations by Josef Beuys, it is on the one hand, um, the show derives its ideas from the concept of the social sculpture, but the con exhibition reflects um, on the significance of nation contained in the name National Gallery, along with other concepts of connectedness, solidarity, and individuality. And it's um, my pleasure to introduce the panelists now, which are Stephanie Komilang, who is a Filipina Canadian artist and filmmaker working in Toronto and Berlin. And her works um, concerns her work concerns the concept of home, often dealing with ideas of diaspora and migration. And through video as a medium, um, Stephanie Komilang explores the conditions. Um, migrants face, in particular exploitation and the adversity they endure when leaving a country for reasons out of their own control. And Stephanie, Lee, Stephanie Kumilang has screened her work um, at the International Film Festival Rotterdam, the Asia Art Archive in New York, Swords Basel, the UCLA and the Ghosts um, 256 Bangkok Video and um, Performance Art Triangle, just to mention a few um, uh, exhibitions she made. Um, our uh, second panelist is Tita Salina. She is a self-taught artist based in Jakarta and her initial workplace is the imagination to performative interventions in the midst of um, yeah, cha chaotic public space of the megapolitan Jakarta, which faces the dilemma of uncontrolled urbanization and pollution. And together with her partner, um, artist Irvan Ahmed, um, she currently is working on a long-term project related to geopolitical turmoil in the Ring of Fire, which is the Pacific Rim, the most prone region to natural disasters, as well as traumatic consequences, consequences which is caused by the persistent ideological violence. High mobility as the main vehicle to participate in residences, residency programs, research, field study, and exhibitions in the specific areas, which is paradoxical, such as some heavenly yet dead for beautiful places on earth. Tita wants to find answers about planetary anxieties in regard to human existence by means of evolutionary perspective and to produce knowledge through arts related to injustice, humanity, and ecolo ecology. And um, Ho Tsun Yen, 
um, is a contemporary artist and filmmaker based in Singapore. His works involve film, video, performance, and immersive multimedia installations, which are bringing together facts and news to mobilize different understandings of Southeast Asia's history, politics, and religion often premised about um, a complex set of references from art history to theater, cinema, and philosophy. Hu Tsun Yen has shown internationally at major exhibitions such um, as the Aichi Triennial in Japan, the Sharjah Art uh, Biennale the United Arab, uh, in the United um, Arab Emirates, and the Gwangju Biennale in South Korea. And in 2011, Hu Tsun Yen represented Singapore at the um, 54th Venice Biennale at the Singapore Pavilion, presenting the work, The Cloud of Unknowing. And um, our um, moderator today, I'm very honored to introduce Alex Kishu. Um, is she is a London-based writer from Manila. And um, I uh, came across her work through her um, first book, which is Small Gods. It's published at Zero Books and was published at Zero Books in 2021. And this book explores the drones, myriad forms through contemporary art. And um, her essays also appear in the White Review, in Wired, the New Inquiry, in Book Forum, in Art Review, in C Magazine, in Real Life, in Spike Magazine, and many others. And she has produced talks and texts for institutions, including Singapore Art Museum, the Power Station of Art, the Yuya Stoschek Collection here in Berlin, and the Rennie Museum. And uh, she studied critical writing at the Royal College of Art. And yeah, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks so much for the introductions, Katharina. It's a huge honor to be here, especially among such esteemed panelists whose work um, is deeply interesting, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Um, I thought we will start um, with um, presentations by each of the artists. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Stephanie for our first presentation today. Hi, that was fast. Um, <laughs> I'm Stephanie and I have um, Stephanie Kamling. I'm a um, filmmaker and artist, um, uh, yeah, working in Berlin. I'm gonna show, first I'll just go straight into it and show um, um, a, the first few minutes of um, the film that's in the exhibition at the Hamburger Bahnhof called Lumapitsa Akin Paraiso, Come to Me Paradise. Um, I'm, it's so I'll, I'll just say something really short about it first. Um, it's, I, I call it a science fiction documentary. Um, I know these are two opposing ideas, but it's something that really fit the theme. So it's a science fiction documentary about Filipino domestic workers um, in Hong Kong told from the perspective of a character called Paradise, who um, is a, a spirit played by a drone. So I'll just um, share my screen and get into it. Tagga saan ka? Narinig ko ang sabi ng ibang mga tao. Yung mga hindi pa nakakita ng mga katulad kong lumilipad ay nagtatanong nito. Pagkatapos, sinusubukan kong ilarawan ang lugar na ito. Noong matagal na panang ako at ang kababaihan ay tumira dito sa ilalim ng mga munting bundok. Kami ang pinakamalakas sa lipunan at mga tagapagsalita. Ginawa namin ang lahat para manatiling magkakasama. Pagkatapos, unti-unting nawala ang aming mga pamamahay, ang aming pinagkakakitaan. Dahil kami ang pinakamalakas, malis kami para maghanap ng bagong pagkakakitaan na pwedeng ipadala sa amin. Ang katulad ko ay mga sugo para sa mga kababaihan. Sa pamamagitan ko, na-upload nila ang kanilang mga pamumuhay na ipinapadala ko sa kanilang mga pamilya para maka-download. Kung anong dahilan, 
nang dumating kami sa bagong lugar. Natanto ko na natatagpuan ko lang ang mga kababaihan kung sila ay magkakasama sa malaking bilang. Ang kinahinat na nito at dahil ang mga kababaihan ay maaari lang lumabas kung linggo, ito ang araw ng aming pagpapadala. Itong linggo, tungkol sa tahanan, natagpuan ko ang sarili kong nag-iisip tungkol sa kanila, tungkol sa sarili ko. Naipangako ng aking kapalarang kuki noong isang araw na ang masama ay nagwakas din at ang mabuti ay malapit ng dumating. Ano nga ba ang aking paniniwalaan? Nakikinig ako ng paulit-ulit yan sa kantang yan ni Timur. Narinig ko rin yung isang babae na kumakanta rin nito. Mabuti ang pakiramdam ko na marinig ito, lalo na galing sa kanya. Gabi na dito. At ako ay paikot-ikot na walang layunin. Bukas ay mahahanap ko sila. Mas mabuting senyas pag sila ay magkakasama. Sa ngayon ako ay walang silbi. Makikinig siguro ako dyan sa pag-uuling na ipinadala ng isang babae ng nakaraang linggo. Buksan! Tingnan natin! Trust issues, and what this means is that somebody or some people from our past has disappointed us, abused us, betrayed us, or hurt us in some way that went deep to our souls, and sometimes had us thinking that maybe it was our fault. And so we don't trust the world around us because we think we might bring that on again, or we think that there's people like that out there, and then they could hurt us again. And so we don't want to trust anybody, and we don't want to trust anything. But what does this do? This makes us incredibly anxious. We get panic attacks, we have anxiety, our blood pressure goes up. Magkita tayo bukas, mga kaibigan. It's not me, it's not super me, voluntarily. Out of world, out of place, free of money. It's not me, it's not super me, no obscurity. Out of love, out of hate, free of money. And if you think that I'm still holding on to stuff, you should go and love yourself. And when you told me that my feet, yeah.
Sa wakas lingguna, nararamdaman ko na ang malakas na senyas. Ibig sabihin, ang mga kababaihan ay nagkukumpulan. Ibig din sabihin na ako ay hindi magkakaroon ng problema ang mahanap sila. Kailangang maalaala ko na mayroon akong layunin. Ako ang tagapagdala. Ako ang sakayan. Ang aking pag-iisa ay pareho sa ibang kababaihan dahil lahat ng video na ginagawa nila ay nakalagay sa aking taguan. Oras na matapos ang pagpapadala, ang bahay ay kompleto na. Nasa sa loob ko pa rin sila. Ang aking pakiramdam ay may katwirang tukon na paglipat sa mga pinaaalam ng mga kababaihan. Kita niyo? Um, so that was the first seven or so minutes of the film. Um, and uh, I, uh, my work, because of where I come from, um, I, I am a child of immigrant parents. My parents um, immigrated from the Philippines to Canada in the 70s under um, the Marcos regime. And um, you know, my understanding of like what home was, um, I sort of had this, this different understanding of what home is and was. So, um, you know, one, there was an idea of the home inside the house and then outside the house was one. So this idea of like home is something that I'm always thinking about, diaspora, um, you know, um, I wanted, the situation in Hong Kong is is one. It's it's interesting because there's no space in Hong Kong. Real estate is something that is is always talked about in Hong Kong. If you've ever been to Hong Kong, um, everything is quite vertical. So this situation, the situation of five hundred thousand migrant um, laborers, migrant women, domestic laborers. Um, 250,000 from Indonesia, 250,000 around from, from the Philippines um, is, is, um, is even more atypical because we, we know that migrant labor exists all, all over the world, but in spaces like this where there is no space, where do the migrant laborers go, um, for instance, on their day off? So if you've been to Hong Kong, again, you know that everything is built vertically. Um, if you, you've been there on Sunday, you know that, that the women on Sundays occupy, um, most notably where the Filipino women hang out on Sundays on their day off is Central, Hong, Central the area of Central, which is normally used for finance. Um, so it's where all the major banks are, um, but the women, because they by law have to live with their employers, um, which makes it hard for them to you know, stay home and, and have their days off. They spill out onto the street, creating this um, kind of sea of women. And what they do is they um, temporarily set up um, private private spaces out of cardboard. Um, so they create these rooms essentially. So you see basically all of these women, again, it's backdrops of banks and, and Louis Vuitton and all of these things, hanging out, dancing, singing, praying, eating, hanging out together, things that we would normally do at home, but in this public space. I wanted to make a film that didn't show the women doing labor. That was something that was really important to me because um, um, like we know that, not because I was trying to get away from it, I, we know that those things exist and we can look at news and um, hear stories. Um, those exist, I, I knew I wanted to tell something um, that had a bit more layers to it. That was a bit more co complicated because it is, you know, it's not just these women are working, it's, it's, it's other things. So I included this character of the drone, Paradise, who um, is in my brain sort of one and the same as the women. She comes from the same place that they come from. She sympathizes with the women. She is not human, um, but she, um, feels the same things that the women feel. And she's sort of working um, with the women 
um, her purpose, she says, as you can see in the, in the film, is to um, take the messages um, that the women have for the families, the messages, the, the videos, the, um, the photographs that they take during the work week, and they somehow upload all of these things to Paradise, and then Paradise sends all of these things back home to their family. Um, so that's sort of like the way that I introduced science fiction into um, the film was to have this other character, this other person, uh, sorry, this other, yeah, this other character that I could myself, when I wanted to use a drone, because I like the ubiquitous ubiquity of the technology. It's something that we all know. Um, and also, uh, it, it definitely has this quality of, um, um, you know, kind of well, well, floating, you know, I wanted, I wanted this, this, I needed to find a camera that could um, embody this character that I was seeking, this sort of spirit character. Um, so the drone was um, something that I turned to, you know, I could also um, give it um, characteristics that I, I, I thought of, I could embed these characteristics in the drone, in this technology. Also, I could give it a voice. Um, I could write dialogue for this character. So yeah, it was some, it was, the drone was something that um, actually made writing and thinking and conceiving this film a lot easier. Um, yeah, I think I'm done. Thanks so much, Steph. Um, that was really beautiful. I thought we could um, follow your presentation um, with uh, Ho Tzu Mien's um, piece as well. Hi. Yeah, this is uh, Tzu Mien. Thanks for having me uh, in the panel. And what I'll do is I will first share my screen. So give me a second. Can everyone see the screen? I suppose, yes. okay. So I'm just gonna speak a little bit about the, the work that I'm showing as um, part of the exhibition. And it's kind of like the main focus of our, for me, the main focus of our discussion today. So the title of the work that I'm sharing is called The Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia. And it's kind of an ongoing project. I guess we can, uh, you know, I would describe it as both a project and a kind of umbrella or meta project that generates many other projects. So uh, for those of you who are interested to have a look at the work, it's uh, a version of it is actually present uh, online. So this is the link. Uh, you can click on it and you know, enjoy the work. And this is a still uh, image of uh, the websites. So I just want to uh, explain a little bit about the website. Um, so in this website, what we are seeing is uh, actually a, kind of a, an archive or database of found footage. All the footage that appears on this work is gleaned from various uh, internet sources like YouTube, Vimeo, or other kind of torrent downloading uh, websites. And uh, what I did with the help of uh, uh, two collaborators who are uh, programmers based in Berlin, uh, namely Jan Goebel and Sebastian Lutgert, is that we created an algorithm which edits all of these uh, found materials according to 26 concepts. So these 26 concepts are the 26 terms of the diction of this uh, critical dictionary of Southeast Asia, there are twenty six terms, uh, you know, because there are twenty six letters in the English uh, alphabets, and I suppose we could kind of like you know imagine the dictionary as a kind of speculative uh, reimagining 
of uh, what is Southeast Asia. So uh, yeah, and I guess, uh, you know, before going further, I wanted uh, as well, oh, sorry, I should also mention that when you are watching uh, the work uh, on, the, uh, on the website, the film itself never repeats. It's, uh, you know, kind of uh, re-edited in real time. But at the same time, uh, the voiceover that you hear, which is performed uh, by a really talented Singaporean uh, musician called Bunny Haeckel, uh, this sung voiceover also has a, it, there's a total of like 10 different versions of uh, voiceovers for each of the terms in the dictionary. So the algorithm is also selecting you know, the, between the voiceovers and the images that it will combine together. Actually, at the same time, the algorithm is also piecing together a musical track, which is made up of a library of uh, sort of a Southeast Asian ethnic music, which is compiled together by um, Japanese musician Yasuhiro Morinaka. But I think on our, you know, our typical kind of like PC systems, which are stereo, we can't really hear this additional music track. So you need like a 5.1 speaker to, to hear the additional track. Yeah, and next, just to kind of like move on, I thought I should, since we are talking about the critical dictionary of Southeast Asia, I should do a kind of like quick refresher for everyone just to kind of like, you know, situate Southeast Asia. Asia. So uh, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, as the name suggests, we are kind of uh, sort of the eastern part and southern part of Asia. So, uh, you know, if, if certain discourses uh, regard Asia as already a kind of like other, I guess we are the periphery of the other, you know, sort of the other of the other. Um, so these are the kind of uh, these are the countries that uh, we usually associate like with um, Southeast Asia. I guess today they are formally united under uh, ASEAN, but uh, you know I think for many Southeast Asians, uh, ASEAN is uh, doesn't mean very much other than a kind of like formal political uh, organization. I should maybe even say that for many Southeast Asians. Um, uh, the, the term Southeast Asia itself is questionable, you know. Um, and this is because, uh, you know, we don't, I guess, we don't really uh, identify ourselves so much with the term Southeast Asia. The term Southeast Asia itself, I would say, is uh, relatively recent. So, you know, the starting point of my projects is a, kind of a simple question, which is basically what constitutes the unity of Southeast Asia, a region never unified by a single religion, language, or political system. So, you know, what delineates Southeast Asia, what produces its inside and its outside? So that's kind of like the, the, the question that I began with, right? So I mentioned earlier that, you know, the term Southeast Asia is uh, pretty uh, new. Um, the earliest trace of it that I could find is from this book uh, by Howard Malcolm in 1839. But, you know, according to a text that uh, Benedict Anderson wrote, for him, you know, the sense of Southeast Asia, the modern sense of Southeast Asia that we are employing today, was produced kind of like in 1941 by these uh, 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 by John Sydenham Furnival, you know. So the way that he uses and applies the term Southeast Asia is kind of like closest to how we define Southeast Asia today. So these emerged in 1941, but it was only in the academia, so it was uh, not very um, kind of widespread. And I would say the term. And this conception of Southeast Asia was, for me, really born um, in the Second World War. So, uh, the, you know, the Japanese, uh, uh, when they sort of entered into the Second World War, they bombed um, Pearl Harbor in a surprise attack. At the same time, uh, as they started the invasion of Southeast Asia for control of uh, resources like oil and rubber, you know, and uh, 
In reply, the Allied forces created what is known as the Southeast Asian Command, which is under the command of Lord Louis Mountbatten. So this is a kind of a strategic command center meant to liberate Southeast Asia from the Japanese. I put liberate under quotation marks because these allied powers wanted to liberate Southeast Asia in order to recolonize it. Right? So I would say that um, the term Southeast Asia kind of like, you know, really uh, start, started to take roots, um, you know, in our consciousness after this, um, after the Second World War. But anyway, you know, just to go back to the dictionary. So the dictionary, as I said, is made up of these, you know, 26 uh, different terms, which are also sort of 26 different ways to reimagine this region, which may or may not exist, or this region, which may not be one. So one of the terms that I, uh, that's in the dictionary and which I produce quite a number of projects from is T for tigers. So just to give you a quick kind of like examples, tigers dispersed across Southeast Asia. When Southeast Asia was one single land mass known as the Sunda Shelf. So after that, sea levels rose and broke Southeast Asia apart, you know. So one million years, it's uh, even before Homo sapiens uh, evolved, you know. So uh, under W, so T is for tiger and under W, it's for wear tiger. So under wear tigers, uh, you know, it, we, you know, I engage with like the myths of wear tigers that we can find almost everywhere in Southeast Asia, you know, so people... Uh, in the kind of old enemies cosmologies regard the tiger as a kind of a container or medium for ancestral spirits. So like shamans could transform into were tigers. You know. And just to quickly also, uh, under N, actually we have N for nation, narration and narcosis, uh, which is also kind of uh, yeah, that we used also, uh, you know, very interestingly as the title of the exhibition at the Hamburger Bahnhof. Um, and the term which I wanted to just kind of like quickly um, share with you today is actually, yes, um, F for friction, fiction and forest. So um, yeah, this is actually a short recording uh, from the uh, from the CDO SEA from the dictionary. Uh, so this footage, uh, you know, just to explain once again, are uh, completely uh, obtained from various online sources, and it's assembled by an algorithm, and the voiceover is also selected by the um, by the algorithm. So I'm just going to choose a short part of this um, sort of auto-generated film uh, around the term F. So this clip is about two minutes. So please enjoy. Why does the tree need... Uh, for fiction, uh, for flight, Air for fluidity, air for forest, air for friction, air for frontier. An ancient Malacca saying goes. F for fiction, F for flight, F for forest, F for friction. On the friction of terrain presented by the density of tropical forests, which halts the onward march of armies and the spread of fictions of the state. The forest is the shelter of those who flee from the state fictions, home to laws, bandits, guerrillas, myths, and magic. 
Effort fiction, effort fluid, effort fluidity, effort forest, effort friction, effort frontier, effort fiction, effort flight, effort fluidity, effort forest, effort friction, effort frontier, effort fiction, effort flight, effort fluidity, effort forest, effort friction, effort frontier, effort fiction, effort flight, effort fluidity, effort forest, effort friction, effort frontier, effort fiction, effort flight, effort fluidity, effort forest, effort friction, effort frontier. I'm speaking to you from the Imaginatrix, a domain outside of space and time. Thank you. I think uh, I will stop here and we can, you know, discuss much more later. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, uh, my name is Tita Salina. I'm from Indonesia. Um, I'm an artist. I make videos, I make installations and performance lectures. And I love doing research. And most of the time I work together along with my life partner, Irwan Ahmed. And uh, today I'm not going to talk specifically about the artworks, but uh, more like a, as a reflections uh, to my practice and the relations through the aerial witness. On the left, if you see, there is this kind of like a measurement. So I just want to put it there so we won't get lost. So you can see like the satellite, the drone and the camera and the, the microscope uh, on below. I would like to start from the something that really huge, like really, really uh, wide, like as wide as this planet, where we couldn't see this planet as a whole, although we stand on it, on the lithosphere. So Indonesia, which is here on the right, uh, is located, uh, is, is located uh, uh, and, and, and accompanied by three plates. Uh, on below is Australian plates, uh, on top is Eurasian plate, and the right side is the Pacific plates on the east sides. Um, so this is this is uh, like one infographic. If you see the colors, so uh, this is this is indicates. The, the, the velocity or the speed uh, of each plate. So you can see like the, 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 the blue and the green is slower than the red and the yellow ones. So uh, of course in the geological time that which is not human scale time, but through sensoric actually uh, and through human eyes, we could sense or we could see uh, if there is disasters or volcanic eruptions are happening at the time. So the Australian plate on below moves, move. I, I, I would like to, to explain a little bit about, about the movement of these plates because it's very interesting. The, the Australian plates is moved to the north and infiltrates the Eurasian plate while the Pacific plates uh, move to the, to, the, to the west, to, the, to our left. And uh, uh, so when these three plates meeting at sea, so it could create like a large earthquakes that occurs a uh, 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 massive tsunamis. So uh, that's why Indonesia is also uh, one of the most unstable places on earth. So if there, there if under there, under under our earth uh, surface, there creates movement, uh, it, cre it will create, um, yeah, it would create like mm, huge movement on the, on, on the surface, like volcanoes eruptions, tsunamis, uh, earthquakes, or even now the combinations between the nature and human activities like floods, uh, land subsidence, or forest fire. Uh, in Java Islands, as you can see uh, this on this image, it is uh, rotated like 90 degrees counterclockwise. 
uh, it has uh, chains of volcanoes. There are around 45 uh, active volcanoes and 10 of them are very, very active. And uh, Java is the most dense population among other islands. So there are uh, 137 million people live there. Uh, it's 55% from the total population, uh, populations of Indonesia. But uh, the interesting thing is, if when there, when there is, um, for example, like the volcano eruptions uh, 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 happening in, in some regions, it triggers a lot of uh, spontaneity things. The altruistic, uh, the altruistic spirits from the community and the solidarity from the grassroots. Uh, from the grassroots. Um, on the other side of the islands, the northern part, the, the abrasions and the sedimentations happen quite rapidly and makes uh, huge portions of lands disappear. And that initiated us to make a working project along Jakarta coastline. We call it Ziarah Utara or the pilgrimage to the north. Uh, together with Irwan and also two uh, uh, Australian artists, uh, Hannah Ekin and Jorgen Doyle, in 2018, we started this walk. Uh, we would like to see and to observe what kind of the net, uh, natural factors or human factors that make uh, the, 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 the situation or the ecological situation like, like today. And... Um, so uh, the sand mining is actually uh, the, the second largest um, explorations in, 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 in the world, uh, in Indonesia, after the water. So uh, this sand mining is coming from, I don't know, somewhere else, like from, from other islands. Uh, it's, it was sent to Jakarta, of course, for the, construct, uh, for the construction uh, 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 industry. And, uh, and of course, it cause uh, like sedimentations and also abrasions that also happens in Jakarta. And uh, this is um, the, the land subsidence also happens in Jakarta, like in some, some, some uh, how do you say, like, like, like some, some locations. Uh, it could be like this, like the under, under the water. So this is one of the uh, public cemetery, uh, Semper. So uh, last year during the second wave of COVID, uh, this, this uh, cemetery could not could not uh, how do you say like could not afford anymore uh, if if dead bodies are coming there, because like one hole of 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 uh, one hole of cemetery could uh, be more than one dead bodies buried there. So the land subsidence actually uh, uh, caused by the massive extractions of the groundwater, and. Uh, unfortunately, not so many people are aware that there are five islands, islands that are already submerged in the mini archipelago. It's called Thousand Islands in the northern, northern side of uh, Jakarta uh, due to the sand mining and the rise of the sea levels. So uh, below this boat is uh, Ubi Islands. So it is already four meter uh, under, under the sea. So um, in 1954, Actually, uh, Indonesia already have the climate refugee because uh, Ubi Island at that time was already very dangerous uh, to live in. So the people have to move to the to the island nearby, and then uh, and now uh, it's already completely uh, submerged. So the the options that the government offer is to build the seawall to 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 how say to to protect Jakarta from the floods. Uh, but uh, sadly, it's actually uh, it limits the it limits the the how say the, the view the horizon from the from the fisherman community. Even it divides uh, the the wall divides them from their boats, and also the 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 other options is the land reclamations. So land reclamations was supposed to build to provide uh, space or land for residentials because uh, Jakarta is already. Uh, very dense, but it turned out uh, uh, on the land on the reclamation islands is only a luxurious residential. So together with the with the scientists friends, uh, we collect we collect the the tests from the sediment taken from the seabed in Jakarta, like about seven to nine meters. 
Um, and uh, it's not really uh, surprisingly that this is how it looks, uh, the, the, the soil. It's really black, it's really oily and it's very smelly. And of course, uh, the result from the, from the sedimentation test is not, uh, it's not good. <laughs> and um, yeah, so in, in 2020, all of a the sudden, uh, there was a, the, the, there was a disruptions. So we somehow were locked down, and then um, our our uh, space our uh, is very limited. So we we don't we we couldn't move uh, really freely like like before. It uh, feels like inside this sinking mosque, and uh, we really depend on uh, on the online meeting platform like Zoom like today. So we uh, on in a way to see on the uh, what's happening on the other side of the world. But uh, actually, the, the passions and the curiosity to explore uh, uh, in ourselves, it still exists. And through remote sensing, uh, we can see and we can observe the conditions, the current conditions, and make comparisons about what's happening in the coastal of Java or other islands like Kalimantan, and uh, to see the, the movement of the water stream. And uh, in general, uh, we would like to observe the color of the dying planets uh, just by sitting in front of our laptops. Uh, through remote sensing, actually, uh, uh, with the scale of Indonesia that is so huge, uh, it could be uh, one solution probably for us to, to observe uh, one issue, for example, like the deforestation uh, in, in Kalimantan or Borneo Islands. But, uh, well, staying, staying inside, uh, uh, it's could be uh, a little bit frustrating and because of because of this curiosity is never is never gone so and 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 we really uh, uh, want to know what's going on uh, uh, beyond beyond our door so uh, together uh, with Irwan and friends from Bandung we brave ourselves to make a road trip uh, across Java and we arrive uh, at um, one ancient capital of Nusantara uh, during the Majapahit Empire. Uh, it is it was exist in 13th to 16th of century, where Majapahit attained uh, its its glory through terracotta craft and agriculture. That was at, uh, that was very advanced at that time. Um, but in the Majapahit side, uh, we couldn't find uh, cemeteries because of the Buddhism and Hinduism uh, were not really common with uh, funerals. So, um, because, uh, and, and people at that time were mostly cremated. So it's quite a surprise for us when I found a skull that is not in a hole. Uh, it was buried like about three meters under, under, the, under the surface. And we call it the left eye. <laughs> So we gained a lot of, quite a lot of information and we would like to know more about what happened to this skull because it's very rare to, to find to find a skull there. But so we need, we need like an extended body or extended tools uh, trying to figure it out uh, what's happening or just simply make uh, assumptions. So uh, this, is, this is the results under the microscope uh, through the magnifying for about 5,000 times. And uh, we also collect uh, uh, um, other materials like the mud from the failure gas drilling in uh, Sido Arjo, uh, East Java. And uh, also um, the, if you see the, the below image on the left, uh, it's, uh, it was taken from the ancient creek in Brebes, uh, in Maribaya. So, um, it is still uh, assumptions actually, but uh, it is believed that uh, we, we do hope that this is, this is true, that this is like a fossilized pollen uh, from the Paleolithic era, because uh, through, this, uh, through these fossils, we, uh, uh, we could reveal, we could reveal uh, uh, about the climate change like million, million years ago. 
uh, and also a, a stem cell on the right image. Um, we also have a chance to pick about how or how do the stem cell looks like. It could be like a future medicines. So uh, through this series of images and all the advanced technology, I feel like a god. Like, uh, but maybe maybe the space uh, only that I cannot be there yet. But it's about time. But the things that remain mysteries and uh, uh, and uh, how do you say like like very very eager to be solved and to be understood is actually the complexity of the paradoxical human's mind. So, uh, so that's why sometimes I feel blessed as an artist because I believe that, that through the art of, uh, through the, this, this medium, uh, I do hope that what I've been doing so far is prob probably on the process to understand the human's mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tita, um, Sue and Stephanie. Um, for your wonderful intros. Um, I know Steph has to leave soon due to an unforeseen circumstance, so we may have a slimmed down panel imminently, but I wanted to say thank you to all three of you for such rich presentations and introductions to our group discussions. Um, can already see so many resonances between these works, um, especially in how this sort of aerial perspective not only captures a certain, uh, I guess a particularity of, um, understanding these sort of territories um, of, or ways of living beyond a sort of individual human scale, but also using it in contrast with the sort of, um, especially in your work, um, Tita, the very sort of material, um, like organic material, the sort of things that um, com are composing the earth itself. Um, so I thought, I liked your little um, scale on the side. I thought that follows our, how I hope to structure this discussion as well, where we be begin with our sort of establishing shot um, with, um, I guess this question is for all three of you, but perhaps um, specifically for Tita and Steph, you sort of begin with these big sort of, um, the city itself appears as like a, a sort of organism. You, you don't quite see the people um, within, within the space. Um, and I was wondering if I could ask both of you about why you chose the drone perspective in particular to establish that sense of scale of a region um, or of a territory that you locate um, your collaborators and your characters within. Uh, sure, I, if that's okay, I'll start Tita. Um, just cause, yeah. Um, so the beginning shot in the film was um, a, um, an aerial, not quite an aerial view, but a landscape view of um, these hills. And the hills are located in the Philippines on an island called Bohol. And they're kind of uncanny. They all are the same height. Um, and in the drier months, they turn brown. So um, in the Philippines are called um, chocolate hills. And the hills were formed during you know, prehistoric times through um, land coming together and pushing up against each other. Um, and this land used to be underwater. So it's all, I th think it's um, made up of, um, oh God, I can't remember now. But um, yeah, it's this, it's this strange formation that everyone in the Philippines knows about, but it's not that well known outside of the Philippines too, too much, I would say. Um, and to me, it, I was looking for a, this shot that could kind of be that no, you know, wasn't really recognizable, but um, a landscape that was strange, a landscape that could, you know, ha had this sense of like, where, where is that? So um, uh, I, I flew the drone there and also it's a way to introduce the character of Paradise. You hear her talking and she's talking about um, where she used to live. Um, this is where she used to live with the women under the hills and she gives a bit of history about um, where they're from. So it's just about introducing the character, introducing this, this kind of strange landscape um, and uh, telling you a bit about the story before it begins. Uh, 
Um, yeah, well, thank you for the questions, Alex. Um, yeah, actually, the, the choice the choice to use drone uh, for some of uh, my works or our works uh, actually, uh, yeah, we would like to to how do you say like like to have like a quite dramatic view and also a non human uh, perspective uh, that 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 the our no, uh, normal human eye uh, cannot cannot see or cannot get it, but. Um, uh, and of course, uh, aesthetically, uh, 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 yeah, using drone is is very dramatic. And and if and if uh, the, I think I think uh, drone can make uh, many kind of environment. Although it's dirty, although it's it's ugly, or even it's it's, it's like a mountainery. It's always beautiful. It's always great. So <laughs> we, you, you cannot you cannot have a, like a ugly shots by drone actually. Like especially if it's like a, the the bird the bird eye view. Uh, uh, that's I think I think that's that's uh, one point that uh, what uh, why I like uh, doing drones. And the other things is um, actually uh, using drones uh, now is becoming uh, uh, more common. But the first time uh, I use. Uh, drawn in 2015 for my 1,000 first uh, uh, islands. Um, it was the first time, and I cannot operate drone until now even. So my friend uh, uh, help uh, help uh, uh, to shut that from me uh, for me. Uh, at that time, it's it's still quite rare in Indonesia specifically, and it's quite uh, expensive, and not so many people have uh, operate drones. So. I think okay, it's quite cool. Maybe like if I if I uh, uh, if I use drone shots from for my films, but actually like um, in some scene, like few scenes uh, from from One Thousand First Islands, um, uh, where I lay down on the on the trash islands, uh, it's already in my mind. Like before it was filmed, so uh, I really really want to to make these shots uh, uh, from from the sky, from really uh, from the top. And run is one of the uh, uh, options that possible. But now, uh, after more and more, uh, I use drones. Um, and I, we used to have drones, but it's broken, it's fall off. Um, actually, uh, when yeah, it's it's not really con uh, uncomfortable to operate drones because it's more worrying than than pleasure, to be honest. Uh, because uh, it's not it's not a cheap uh, equipment, and it's it and if it's fell, it's fell, it's it's broken. So I there's no way that you can fix it. But uh, somehow uh, uh, it also creates I don't know like a <laughs> psycho <laughs> like a psycho feelings. Like if you see your drones flying uh, like uh, 30 meters or 20 meters above the sky, uh, you feel like, okay, yeah, fall, fall, fall. Like <laughs> you have this demon sign, uh, demon, de demon sound uh, on the other side of, of, of your head. <laughs> um, I love the idea of the drone as a demon sound. That's, that's how I opened my book actually with the sort of sound of the drone as a signifier of death. Um, but I thought that what you said was really interesting about how like the drone vision, it's impossible to actually have an ugly shot from it. And um, <laughs> Sue, I was wondering if um, you could talk a bit more about, um, I know that this footage is mostly found um, and interleaved with some of your own work and performances, <laughs> but the idea of the drone yeah, footage as something that conveys like an official or like industrial perspective how do you sort of like consider that um, in relation to the other types of footage that sort of is assembled and appears um, in your endlessly recombining film? Yeah, thank you for the question. So actually, you know, uh, just to state up front, I have never ever used a drone uh, before, much as I enjoy, uh, you know, looking at drone footage. So as you said, um, sort of the drone shots that appear in the Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia are all uh, found uh, footage, you know. And yeah, so for me, like, you know, all the images that appear in uh, the Critical Dictionary of Southeast uh, Asia, th there is a certain kind of uh, underlying strata of, uh, uh, you know, that... Uh, 
is homogenous through all of them, which is that they are all uh, gleaned from internet sources, uh, which is to say that I receive them always already in the form of data. You know, so actually for me, I make no distinction uh, within the dictionary, like between types of shots or shots that are produced through, uh, you know, different types of instruments. So uh, be it a drone shot or, you know, like a, a shot from the iPhone or a sort of a professional camera, like I don't really uh, distinguish them. But, you know, listening to your question, it makes me think, uh, you know, like that for me, the drone, you know, thinking about the drone is always already an analogical, metaphorical process because I don't use drones directly. So my relationship to them is uh, sort of always at a distance and, uh, you know, and, but it did make me think, however, that, you know, drone, the prevalence of like drone shots, drone technology today has much to do actually with um, digital technology. You know, so, you know, drones have become affordable because they've become light, you know, and this lightness of the drone machines is also uh, in part due to sort of, I guess, the, the technology of the recording, uh, you know, which is entirely digital. So, you know, also the lens, uh, for example, maybe, you know, it's uh, like improvements in these technologies enables it to I guess, free itself from, from gravity, you know. So there's something already like, uh, you know, this. So what I'm also trying to say is that kind of like, you know, when we think about drone shots, there's a kind of like smoothness to them. I mean, they fly, you know, high above. Um, of course, they still meet with resistance and the turbulence of the air, but it's already liberated from um, sort of the friction of the terrain. Uh, you know, that most other kind of like cameras are still stuck with, right? But I would say like, you know, beyond and possibly like above this layer of like smoothness of the sky is the smoothness of the data, you know, the data and the space of like data transmission is kind of maybe the smoothest uh, sort of like, um, you know, space for, for, for images. And I would see the drone as kind of like part of this like lineage of images uh, increasingly become mean smooth, which is also related to a kind of like sensation of speed as well. Yeah. Um, there's a lot, there are many directions I wanna take from that. Um, it's really evocative and it really resonates with um, my book, Small Gods, really takes the drone as like a starting point for this sort of metaphorical expansion um, and considering the relationship between things like technology, spirituality, um, and sort of the imaginaries around both. Um, what you said about the lightness of the drone and sort of Tita saying the same thing about this sort of consumer object that allows you to sort of free yourself from an earthly perspective, um, but actually it's built like kind of a shitty toy. There's like a strangeness um, in that, but it also reminds me of like a quote that I think I read when I was reading about both of your works, I forget who, but credit to that reviewer um, by Donna Haraway. Um, and she sort of describes um, how our most beautiful machines are made of light. So things like um, cinema, even um, data transfer itself being um, dependent on sort of light, it, um, but then contrasting that with like the degree of human pain that is required to produce that, that's sort of the contrast that she makes the sort of like groundedness of, of the labor and the material of the production of something that is sort of light and seemingly freed from earth or in a cloud or, you know, boundless sort of ways of conceptualizing that. Um, and a question I had for both of you was actually um, about that materiality. I think in both of your works, it's uh, the sense of saturation of that is very different, but very present. So in Tita, you have this sense of the material of earth um, sort of infused with, um, I guess, the Anthropocene um, in terms of how our plastics um, are present in the soil and in the water. Um, and then Sue, it's information itself um, that is infusing. Um, it's sort of, you, you give us this 
um, information overload that almost resists uh, clarity and narrative um, to instead give us this sort of numbing sense of um, Southeast Asia as an entity. Um, and I was wondering if you could both speak a bit more, this is a very like broad question, but about that sort of your relationship to the sort of earthly material within your work in contrast with these like separated um, sky bound visions. Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, for me drawn uh, as a tools to as also for the, to, to, to document uh, as, a, as an evidence, for example, or also uh, to, to, invest, to investigate uh, some things uh, at the locations where uh, it's difficult to reach, for example, like, uh, like the, uh, uh, like the, 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 private, the, the private space that used to be a public space, but, but now because it's privatized, for example, we cannot uh, uh, go there, go in there. So uh, I can use drone as, as to document this, this, this kind of things. And also, um, um, yeah, and also to, 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 to documents like some, pla some places like uh, quite dangerous uh, uh, for us, like when we went to uh, this um, a hot mud uh, due to the failure of gas drilling in Lupur Lapindo in East Java in, La, uh, in Situ Arjo. So it was very hot. So uh, of course it's, it's extremely dangerous to come near. So yeah, we, we, we sacrifice our, our drone and uh, to, to, to go near and, and, and to, to shot some, some, some shots. But actually, uh, <laughs> um, and and also uh, 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 when we went to Kalimantan, so uh, we met with uh, Bekantan monkey. So we so so I fly I fly I fly the drone and and uh, uh, but it never reached the point uh, where the Bekantan lives because it fell off I don't know how is the malfunctions happening and uh, but it's but when it was falling down it was still recording so uh, and and we can see all together and we also screaming all together it's as if like our heads are falling it's like, like ah, and it and then it's crash and then it's off <laughs> so yeah i never i never see i never see what kind of uh, bekantan a house looks like uh, until now so i think yeah i think that's i don't know if i can give you proper answer but yeah this is this is the the things that uh we really like to use drone as a tools yeah to investigate or to yeah to document yeah thanks for that tita uh yeah i'll jump in now with just a few kind of like probably random unconnected thoughts but <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, thinking about Alex, this is a very interesting, uh, you know, question. I, I was kind of like, you know, thinking in my presentation as well. I was, uh, I showed a slide, which tried to reintroduce, you know, as a reminder for everyone, like, you know, all the Southeast Asian countries, right? So we look at this map. Uh, and this map of like Southeast Asia with all the different country names and the borders drawn very sharply and very clearly delineated, you know. It's also a kind of view 
from the top, like from the sky, sort of liberated from the earth. You know, you have this uh, kind of like artificial sort of abstract map, you know, where map makers and I guess kings and like politicians, you know, they can very, uh, with this kind of like degree of ease, tell themselves this is where the, the borders of like my empire or my state ends, you know, and the border is drawn so kind of like, uh, confidently in these very sharp uh, lines, right? But we all know that in, in reality, borders are like fuzzy, you know, they are fuzzy kind of like lines and they are messy, you know, especially uh, in a lot of these, uh, uh, yeah. uh, in many parts of Southeast Asia as well, the borders kind of like flow into, into each other, right? So this idea of like drones looking from the top, you know, and this kind of like abstract, God's eye view, uh, you know, it's a kind of uh, liberation or separation from the from the mass, I would say, of uh, the earth, you know, which is, uh, yeah. but it also makes me think, you know, a little bit about the sort of the evolution of like camera and image making technologies. So like maybe a few decades ago, you know, uh, like, uh, when you need to move cameras, you know, you have uh, dollies, which is like, which are like tracks, right? So tracks are laid onto the ground and you push, um, you know, the camera. And you can often feel sometimes when it's moving on the ground that it's, the ground is not uh, uh, smooth, you know, so you feel the earth uh, sort of giving bumps. And then maybe two couple of decades ago, we had the steady cam. You know, so the steady cam is a kind of uh, invention where the camera is rigged to the body and it has an internal set of um, balances. So the, the camera always looks like it is gliding, you know, so you, you almost feel this gliding presence that is already liberated from uh, the, the messiness of the terrain. And then, of course, I would think of um, the drone as the extension of the steady cam because now you have this kind of smoothness and you can even elevate like far higher than the ground, you know, but at the same time, I would say in the last couple of decades, it's also the, the time of animation, right? So, you know, a lot of uh, Hollywood films that we see now, you know, like, you know, the, the extras in the background are all uh, animation, even though, even though they look like super real. You know, so animation has also infiltrated into, into uh, image making. And I would say animation is the most free of gravity, you know, even compared to the drone. Uh, in fact, I would define animation as images that no longer have any gravity like uh, within them. So, you know, so these kind of like developments are kind of like, um, you know, parallel, which is kind of like quite, you know, uh, I I interesting for me to think of like in, in terms of this gradual kind of like abstraction of, of the image. Thank you so much for your responses. Um, that's really interesting. I think that one of the things I was thinking about a lot in my research was actually contrasting an artist that I um, wrote about, Lawrence Leck, actually uses Unreal Engine to render his environment, but there's drone characters within it. So it's like that double anti-gravity. So the drone is floating within the void there. Um, but there was something you said about, I actually wish Steph was still here because she actually intentionally uses the steady cam with the drone in her films. Um, and something I've been thinking about a lot is that, you know, how do you convey a sort of otherworldly or sort of spirit perspective? Um, obviously the history of cinema has some like strange occult dimensions to it, but I think there is something really interesting in, in um, Sue, what you were saying about the wear tiger as well, like these entities that become um, almost like mediums for ancestral spirits, for our memories, um, things like that. I think some of that has been transposed onto technology, um, at least if you're approaching it from this almost tech, not just a techno animist sense, but in a very practical sense, like yourself, Tita, where the technology can sort of see what you can't physically see, um, or it enables you to sort of collect memories or data in ways that perhaps um, augments um, what you are capable of as a human. Um, that's very sort of accepted 
knowledge in terms of how we conceptualize technology now. But I think the 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 drone and the wear tiger make it very evident um, in that way. Um, I did want to move into perhaps thinking about um, actually land, um, this sort of um, I guess land and territory of seen from the perspective of the drone, sort of what you described, Sue, with the sort of um, clear borders that are a fiction, um, and yourself, Tita, in the in the archipelago work, this sort of idea that um, you sort of locate us in a landscape that is very particular. You have this sort of fishing settlement, you have the metropolis in the background, you have this sort of verdant green space, and then you have this sort of in seemingly infinite ocean that sort of swallows it all up and then your site specific work sort of highlights the scale of that. Um, and I wanted to get both of you um, to speak a bit more about the sense of territory in your work. Um, and I guess the contrast between how you understand territory is constructed. Um, Tita, your work around, you know, this is a commentary on like uh, reclaimed land and development. Um, and Sue, it's a sort of imaginary construction of a region and the nation states within it. Um, we could move a little bit beyond the drone here, but I was curious about how you guys um, think about that um, and how in your films you think about um, what moves sort of indiscriminately across borders. So information, garbage, water, um, and how do people actually shore up and try to reinforce those borders? Um, Zhu, you want to answer first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks again for, for the really nice uh, question. So while, while listening to your question, you know, I started thinking uh, about Benedict Anderson, I guess was the inescapable like reference. If we start thinking about things like imagined, you know, community, about these like abstractions of like communities. And so, you know, I think one of the key examples of uh, Anderson that I could re remember still from his kind of like classic text was that, you know, the Im imagined community was produced, for example, by the newspaper. So like everyone in the same territory, <clears throat> you know, I think he even wrote like this small kind of like scenario and people, you know, wake up every morning in the same territory, reading the same newspaper, you know, and reading this same newspaper produces this like notion of the imagined uh, community, right? So the newspaper as this kind of like medium of nationhood, you know, uh, you know, it's interesting. But I think it was probably Anderson who also mentioned that, you know, actually roads, we can think about roads and railways as well as another medium that produces nationhood, right? So roads, like they connect like a, a, a territory and it sometimes even, you know, creates like boundaries like within a, a, a particular territory. So railways as well, you know, and what roads and railways kind of have in common is also this gradual overcoming of friction, you know. So if we think about rough terrain, like uh, rocks, pebbles, you know, there's always a kind of friction, you know, so roads and railways enable smoothness uh, and speed. So it, it produces this smooth space, which lends itself to a kind of like, you know, unification, which is a uh, territory, you know, which in turn leads to like our identification with it. So, you know, just to kind of like switch to another, you know, great historian of theories of like Southeast Asia, uh, which is James C. Scott, uh, who wrote the art of not being governed. You know, he was describing Zomia, which is the highland uh, areas, sort of in the northern part of like continental Southeast Asia, you know. So highland areas as in, I think it's like 300 feet above ground, you know, and this, uh, high altitude, you know, already produces a, a, a intense form of friction, you know. So I think Scott mentions that armies run out of uh, breath on high altitudes, you know. So this could resist this high high altitudes as a kind of friction um, 
resist sort of state control around the Zomia areas, right? But I think, you know, suddenly I was recalling that, like, I think in the, at the end of his book, he sort of mentioned that what he just described of Zomia is this space of kind of like organic anarchism that resists state control is coming to an end because of technology. Because with technology such as the drone, you know, uh, these kind of frictions of the terrain is kind of uh, sort of rendered ineffectual. It is all now uh, kind of like completely uh, smoothened out. So I think, uh, you know, uh, so we could kind of like, you know, back to the short little clip that I shared with all of you from the dictionary, which is F for fiction, F for friction. You know, um, I would say that this friction of terrain is kind of like ironed out so that the fiction of the nation state, you know, it's, uh, is, is enabled, you know. So, uh, yeah, maybe I will just kind of like stop there for now. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the questions. Oh, sorry. Hello. Yeah. Thanks for the questions, Alex. I hope I can answer <laughs> that. It's really nice. Uh, well, um, yeah, I think, I think territory, uh, if you're talking about territory based on the, on us as people, as humans, uh, I think territory is just like a fiction line like the territory of the of the states or territory of the, yeah state for example so it's just I, th I think it's just like a fiction lines um but it really changed a lot of things like and also it also creates problems like un uh, countless problems but comparing to the territory uh, 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 in nature uh, or in biology is is completely different things. Like uh, the the territory in the forest, for example, is really um, depends on the altitudes. Like uh, the the territory between forest and the mountains, so it really depends on the altitude. It really depends on the humidity, uh, uh, temperatures, and also um, a lot of factors. A lot of uh, law of nature, for example, and, and talking about the territory in the water, for example, like, like fish, like we have, we have salt fish, we have freshwater fish, we have uh, fish who, uh, who only live on the lakes. So they don't mix to each other. They have their own territory. So they don't, they don't uh, disturb each other. But if you're talking about uh, a more complex animal, like, like monkey, uh, in Jakarta, for example, we uh, now we only have a one dedicated uh, mangrove forest, uh, and it has a few groups, a few groups of of uh, macaca, the the long-tailed monkey. Uh, it becomes more complex because they have to fight to get their own territory. So one 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 colony, it it can, it could have like thirty to sixty uh, uh, monkeys. So. Uh, Almost all the time, they have to fight to, for food or to fight for 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 women to 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 breed yeah, to produce. Uh, they have to fight. So there's other things. But if we if we step up again to 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 humans, so yeah, like like this, we it's much more complex and much more um, yeah, like in Russia and in Ukraine, for example. <laughs> and if and uh, talking about back to drone. Uh, uh, Drone also uh, uh, in specific area is very have limited territory because uh, 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 like in Jakarta, for example, you cannot fly, uh, you cannot fly drone near the airport. You cannot fly uh, drone uh, near the harbor. So uh, yeah, even, even for the te te technology, uh, it, uh, uh, let's say it uh, recognized territories. Thanks. <laughs> Um, oh, Sue, did you want to add something? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, well, you know, listening to, to Tita and also thinking back about your question, you know, I was also thinking, you know, that it's, it's interesting that, you know, the, the usage of <laughs> drone, uh, you know, which then would make us immediately think of like surveillance, you know, with uh, these kind of like drone machines flying over enemy airspace, right? But I think what we seem to be interested in is actually the coexistence of like different types of shots, which is the coexistence of like different 
perspectives. And these different perspectives can be human. Mm. You know, sometimes certain mm. camera angles, they seem mm. to uh, embody a human perspective. But some of these shots could be non-human. So for example, you don't have to be a drone shot to be like a non-human perspective. Like even a super microscopic uh, shot actually also allows you a kind of non-human perspective. Actually, cameras and lenses is the long history of like, you know, kind of non-human vision, you know. So even camera that allows us to like slow down or speed up actions, it's already giving us access to kind of like non-human um, perceptions. But what's interesting is to assemble all these different perspectives uh, together and to arrive at some kind of messy plurality, you know. So, yeah, thank you. I feel like you read my mind and anticipated my next question for you both because it was going to be, um, I know we have to move into Q&A soon, but my last, my final question was actually going to be around that plurality of perspectives in your work and in Stephanie's work as well. Um, in Tita, your work, you, you involve um, quite a few collaborators, um, especially ones who are embedded in the communities. Um, that you're working with, but also, you know, you mentioned scientists, collaborators, a sort of wealth of, um, of contributors to your, your final pieces. Um, and Sue, so it's, your collaborators are almost distributed, <laughs> decentralized, and you're also collaborating with um, not just the engineers behind your algorithm, but the sort of contingency of that algorithm itself. Um, so, um, Thinking in the spirit of this plurality of perspectives, I was wondering if you both wanted to uh, maybe close this part of our panel about speaking about, um, yeah, the potential of that uh, collaboration and how you see it in relationship to, um, I suppose for, uh, for both of you, this sort of archival documentary practice, your modes of challenging things like, um, you know, historical truth, um, uh, narratives of development, um, a great wealth of sort of received knowledge. I think both of your works are very powerful in how um, they challenge it through this sort of plurality shared perspective, um, which is a very long way of asking you about the role of collaboration and participation in your works. Um, yeah, I think, um, um, yeah, what, what can I say? Um, I think I like I like to work with uh, multidisciplinary people or with the with the local community. I think uh, to gain uh, a lot a lot of perspective, I think is important. Um, uh, I really like, for example, in the in the fisherman community, they they have they have a lot of uh, they have a lot of uh, traditions. They have a lot of uh, 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 old old cultures. And they still carry on until today, but uh, on the other uh, on the other hand, uh, it somehow can conflicts with the with the with with their beliefs, like 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 uh, Islam, for example. But uh, uh, this this I really like, like the 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 coalitions between 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 the the old traditions and the and the beliefs. And also, uh, uh, it really enriches uh, uh, the the projects, the concept, and it's not only uh, how do you say, like only coming from uh, one directions, but it's um, it can uh, how do you say, it can accommodate uh, a lot of a lot of uh, perspective, and uh, uh, and also with with the other uh, disciplines like the scientists. Uh, uh, I think it's also um, how to say it's also enrich it's also enrich enrich and just the project itself like uh, the other the other perspective because because through scientists it's it's more like uh, we we work with the data we work with the facts and sometimes it's uh, it's uh, undebatable because it's numbers it's facts but uh, but um, yeah. Uh, uh, uh um yeah <laughs> that's all <laughs> and um uh yeah yeah okay yeah go ahead <laughs> i lost the words 
Yeah, I will. I will. I will jump in now until you can think <laughs> of the, the loss. The, you can recall the lost words. You know, I think uh, for, for me, in relation to the dictionary, as you mentioned, the the, the images come from all types of sources. Uh, they come from home videos to you know, kind of like serious movies to like. Uh, uh, footage that's done for some kind of like technical uh, studies. So it's basically like uh, all kinds of images from all different types of sources are equally welcome in, in the dictionary. So in some sense, I think about it as a kind of a strange kind of like anthropology of like, you know, uh, of, of images kind of uh, related to um, uh, no, Southeast no, Asia, no. yeah, <laughs> and I think you know I I think this this notion of many differences, you know, um, things that are completely different but sort of coexisting on the same plane uh, is is kind of like one of the driving uh, mm? uh, uh, forms that I had in mind in uh, mm -mm. thinking about the dictionary. You know. So I think alongside with these kind of multiplicity, I think it's also interesting to think about like switching of scales. So it's not just switching between perspective, it's important to switch between scales. So from the nano to the cosmo, maybe like from the microscopic to the telescopic, you know. So uh, and understanding these like very different types of scales is like for me, the only way we can understand what's happening to our planet today, which you know is uh, is under sort of very different regimes of time, you know, like uh, you know, you have the time of like the work day, but you also have the time of the geologic, which is the volcanoes that you know Tita has been like you know speaking about so nicely, you know, and also the and sort of the anthropom uh, anthropocene, you know, where humans kind of like mess with other kinds of scales you know so i think you know multiple perspectives and like multiple kind of like time scales and the ability to switch between them and also just to kind of like have a vision where they could all kind of like coexist without contradiction you know it's, it's probably something i think it's kind of like for me at least a useful way of like thinking about the world yeah, so Tita, back to you. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, I could go on. I do want to keep talking about this forever, but I thought we should share the floor um, with our audience. Um, I see a couple of questions have come in. So if you guys are watching right now, do you put them in the chat so you can have access to them? Um, ask us anything. Um, but I will kick off with um, a first question from Tintin. Um, so I'll read it out loud. Um, my question is for all of you and the curators of the show as well. So Katharina, if you want to jump in, you can answer as well. Um, back in early and mid 2010s, when we hear about drone art, we tend to hear about its connection with stealth attacks. Um, thinking about works like uh, James Bridle's Drone Shadows and Trevor Paglin's, um, so visuality and visibility are discussed quite differently um, than in this exhibition. Um, it's true that consumer drones are more available to artists to do their work, um, but how do you see your usage of drones and how do the curators see these new usage of drones against the backdrop of the military uses of drones as remotely piloted aircraft? So I guess the history of the technology and its current uses in a militarized space versus its sort of consumer and artistic and cultural uses now. Yeah, maybe I will just start off with some, again, random thoughts, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that, you know, these uh, examples that, you know, so anyway, hello, Tintin. Yeah, and yeah, it's interesting that the, the examples brought up yeah. are kind of slightly earlier, I would say, uh, you know, yeah. and these works seem to be kind of like slightly earlier and sort of the obsession is also with the military industrial, you know, which is 
you know, definitely inevitably like kind of part of the lineage and the genealogy of these technologies that we employ, you know. So I think these works are like kind of like um, spot on in their criticality, you know. But at the same time, I think it's interesting that we find this kind of drone technologies being misused or abused in other kind of like creative ways, you know. So like what Stephanie did with like, you know, uh, making the drone a character, which is, uh, you know, or uh, putting these kind of like drones to other types of uses that, you know, probably the people who designed them didn't imagine. And I think this is kind of like part of our long history of like, you know, creative abuse of like technology, you know, uh, which kind of like really redeems technology in many ways. But I, you know, I, but for me personally, I think it's nevertheless important also to re recall these early genealogies and to think about these technologies in a didactical way, you know, so we can put them to these kind of creative uh, use. But at the same time, you know, uh, these technologies, using these technologies also make us inevitably, perhaps in some ways, part of these kind of like, you know, e economies of the gaze of uh, surveillance, uh, etc. So, I, you know, that's the way I would deal with these um, kind of mixed histories. Yeah. Um, do you want me to jump in? Do you want oh, okay. me to say? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, no, I just want, yeah, I just wanted to to yeah say what um, I can repeat what um, Sue said, and I think it's really um, it's a specific time of using drones in um, art, and as uh, Sue said, it's it's we are showing here um, works from another period, and I think what 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 makes it quite clear is um, that, mm. or what makes it interesting is that the drone yeah, or the drone yeah. technology no, 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 no. Um, shows interestingly how um, close caring, curiosity, surveillance and um, destroying are, right? And these are all characteristics of the state, of the nation state, and but they are all interpreted and realized in very different ways. And I think um, it's interesting how, how this, in one technology, you can really um, concentrate the whole question of what does, what is the role of a state in a community? Caring, surveillance, destroying. So it's um, really interesting that the drone is a metaphor or it could be a metaphor for the state, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. Talking talking about about drones in military. Uh, uh, I think yeah. It's it's really uh, dangerous. And it's really uh, for me to imagine that it's really scared. And as we can see now, the the military budgets. I think most of all countries are increasing and. Compared to art budgets, <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> but uh, I also aware that uh, uh, we use drones and uh, at the same time so we produce data. So I'm not sure if it's uh, the data uh, that recorded and this memory card is really uh, my data. So nobody can see it. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a factory made. So. Uh, there's still a lot of, of course, uh, things that we don't know about about drone itself. And um, yeah, like we can see like uh, now the drone is becoming more and more popular. And then a lot of YouTubers, they use they use drone only to to only to to produce like dramatic uh, uh, scenes, no context, just just beautiful view from the beach like and uh, but um, this also produce data. So and of course, uh, uh, um, uh, it's very possible that uh, uh, the giant tech uh, 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 utilize this 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 uh, this big numerous data from drones. But uh, heading back to 1800s, it reminds me of uh, Franz Willem Jung Hoon. So he is uh, he is a European uh, German born uh, naturalist and biologist. 
So in the 1800, 1813, if I'm not mistaken. So he was sent to East Indies. So now Indonesia in, in Java and Sumatra. So he actually uh, was an artist and um, he has, he has uh, drawn he, he, his, his creations. His creations, uh, 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 he, he, he draw about the mountains. He draw the craters of Tangkuban Perahu, for example. But at that time, of course, uh, there was no, no drone. So he climbed the mountain by himself. So he climbs, like in total, he climbs about 42 mountains around Indonesia. But so, so he produced a lot of drawings, a lot of paintings, really beautiful paintings about, about mountaineries, about volcanoes. He was he 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 was a good person, I'm sure. But at that time, he was sent by uh, by this uh, by by European for intention. For uh, uh, I mean, I mean the, the results that he creates. Of course, it it contains a lot of informations, but uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, it 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 was uh, it arrived at the colonialist hands. So. So that's that's uh, unfortunately that's the beautiful picture uh, end up with. So it's it's uh, it is worked for the for the invasions of the of the of the lands at that time. So uh, I think I think uh, if 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 we uh, if we recall that story, I think we should be careful about 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 drone itself. Um, but yeah, I think I think for my for my footages for my uh, drone shots, uh, I think probably uh, it could be end up at the giant tech, for example. It probably I don't know it what for. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tita. I think there's no more questions um, in the chat. Surprisingly, maybe everyone's just soaking in you guys' brilliance. Um, but I thought that this, I mean, thank you, Tintin, because I think we can reach towards a conclusion with this. I'll add a couple of comments because this question actually specifically addresses what I write about in my book. I begin with um, this sort of militarized history of the drone, but actually link it to how um, a lot of the tech consumer technology we know and love today are intricately linked to um, technologies of militarization and surveillance. Um, and I think, um, yeah, how that sort of mobilized to create works of um, beauty and the sort of, um, as Sue says, the sort of dialectic relationship between the two um, is deeply interesting. Um, but I also agree with Sue um, that the, what, the cause for optimism is always the off-label uses um, of these items. Um, and also um, uh, with Tita and with some sort of uh, uh, ecological researchers that I've sort of interviewed and spoken with, there is also this idea of, um, you know, uh, something that retains an imprint of its military origins can still be used um, in a sort of pragmatic sense to help us sort of understand um, and, I'm not sure, but perhaps optimistically um, relate to the planet around us at, at a planetary scale. Um, so yeah, oh, we have a response in the chat. Um, oh, Tintin says, talking about artists, scientists, and complicity, Sun Yan in a recent interview, um, James C. Scott mentioned working for the American intelligence during his research in Southeast Asia. And, Thanks you all for your insights. Um, so yeah, um, on that note, I thought, um, Katharina, if you wanted to say some closing words, but for me personally, I just wanted to thank you all for being here today. Um, I found the conversation really enriching and I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, so thank you to the Goethe Institute for the invitation, to Katharina as well, um, uh, to Tita and Stephanie for their um, really sort of um, rich and insightful um, and challenging works um, and, and for the conversation as well. So yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, and I'll hand over to Katharina for any closing remarks. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to mention what is for me really, really the interesting point is about this frictionlessness and the smoothness of the drone, which is also um, brings um, all of you together in regard to um, borders or not borders, like the plastic pollution, which 
is not uh, interested in borders or like um, through your work for the for the uh, Venice Biennial, the cloud it doesn't take care of borders and but the drone can can of course survey it etc so it's a really really interesting ongoing theme and I hope that we can still um, keep this up also Tintin thank you for your question very very interesting and I wish we could have be all in one room and have coffee now and discuss this further. Um, but so far, I really would like to thank all of you, my um, your amazing panelists for the wonderful conversation, always enriching to talk to you. Um, also for the Goethe Institute for the invitation, Nina and Rangi, and of course Maya for the always perfect um, organization. And I also want to, would like to thank my colleagues, Grace Sambo, Gritia Gavevong, and Jun Yap, um, and all the teams, and which for Berlin, can, Berlin consists of Charlotte Knaub as an assistant curator, and Rosalia Namzai Engchuan as our Goethe Institute fellow. So thank you also for all the people behind the scenes. And um, our next online event will be um, on Thursday, the 28th of April, same time, same place. And it will be hosted by my dear colleague, June Yap from the Singapore Art Museum. And will be a conversation with Professor Kanaga under the title, The Entangled Historian of Gatherings and Coteries and Seeing and Writing. And I'm very much looking forward to this event and hope to see you all soon in online or um, in real life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.